So of course, we've all been inundated the last couple of days with these images of black men being killed by police. And though my talk was well planned before this particular moment, what we're gonna talk about today are these connections between the historical images of, of black men that inspire fear, not just in police officers, but Americans alike. The title of my talk is Devil Wanna Put Me in a Bow Tie. It, of course, is a lyric from Kendrick Lamar from his 2015 song, I. In the lyric, Kendrick writes, I've been through a whole lot of trials and tribulations, but I know God, the devil wanna put me in a bow tie. The chorus, and I love myself, when you're looking at me, tell me what you see, I love myself. And I was struck by that idea of wearing a bow tie because we're in a particular historical moment now where there seems to be a proliferation of Negroes with bow ties. <laughs> we have the gentleman on the top right who is a British businessman. Uh, we have a brother on the bottom who, who we know as, if you watch The Wire, Brother Muzon, and we'll talk about Brother Muzon in a second. And we have young men from an academy in Chicago which purports to be able to graduate 100% of their students every year. What has occurred in the context of these moments, particularly since the election of Barack Obama in 2008, is that there is a movement within black America that somehow if you have the first black president, somehow that young black people need to dress the part. That if we wear bow ties, if we stop sagging, if we buy into what we might think of as a politics of respectability, now, of course, black folks have always worn bow ties. Black men have always worn bow ties. I wore a bow tie when I was four, <laughs> having worn a bow tie as an adult. The gentleman at the bottom, Brother Muzon, and for those of you who watch The Wire, you know that he was a bit of an enforcer. For those of us who watched The Wire for so many years, when we first saw Brother Muzon, what we saw was a member of the Fruit of Islam, uh, which, of course, is the paramilitary wing of the nation of Islam, who always wear bow ties, right? and provide security not just for the nation of Islam, but also very well-known black celebrities. And we think about where this goes fully, this idea of a politics of black respectability, considering this tweet from Dr. Steve Perry, who is a well-known educator, who tweets, I witnessed 200 boys voluntarily cut dreads, braids, unkept frosh, because I am Steve Harvey, Steve Harvey, the US Army, connected aesthetics to success. And this is where this bow tie narrative is problematic, that somehow that if young black people not dress the part, not only will they be successful in school, that somehow it would also save their lives. Now, of course, I'm a professor at Duke University. If I teach a class that's 8.30 in the morning, three quarters of those students are white students who shuffle into my class wearing pajamas and flip-flops, uncombed hair, and baseball caps. And none of them are of the belief that there's a connection between their intellectual capabilities and how they chose to roll out of bed that morning when they came to my class. So we're wondering where this is coming from. And of course, we might argue that this politics of black respectability is a response to the violence that historically has been directed at black bodies in general, and in this case, specifically, black male bodies. In 2011, the good folks at the Opportunity Agenda issued a report. This is November 2011. This is important because it is literally a few months before the killing of Trayvon Martin. And what the Opportunity Agenda did is they did a study of how images of black men and boys circulate in American culture. What they said is that there were distorted patterns of portrayal, underrepresentation of black men and boys. And of course, that might sound a little strange, but for a moment, if you factor LeBron James and Barack Obama and Kanye West and Jay-Z out of the equation, there is exactly very few representations or diverse representations of black men and boys in mainstream culture. He also said that whenever there were presentations of black men and boys, it was always with a negative association, limited positive association, and more importantly, when black men and boys were presented in mainstream culture, it was always within the context of a problem frame. What do we do with these black men and boys? They go on to say that these images, in fact, create casual links to media and public policy, creating general antagonism, exaggerated views of criminality and violence. Think about the ways that we talk about young black men smoking weed who play college football. 
as a criminal act, for instance, even though the smoking of marijuana is like legal in a bunch of states. Exaggerated views of criminality and violence, lack of identification and sympathy, and support for punitive responses to black men and boys. So we might want to ask where some of this might come from. So the great scholar Clyde Teller wrote in 2000, black men are densely mythogenic, the objects of layered fictions produced by others. What does it feel like to be a myth Du Bois might have asked instead of to be a problem? And then, of course, we get Officer Darren Wilson from just two years ago. At this point, it looked though he was almost bulking up to run through the shots. Like it was making him mad that I'm shooting at him and that face that he had was looking straight through me like I wasn't even there. I wasn't anything in his way. Confirming the very thing that Clyde Taylor talked about in the first place. And you might ask, where might some of this fear come from? So some of you should know the gentleman behind me, Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight champion of the 20th century, because uh, there was one in the 19th century. And to put Jack in some sort of context, this is an era of race in America that's defined by Jim Crow, that's defined by high instances of lynchings. And in this context, what was Jack Johnson's job? I always get a kick asking students about this, like, oh, he's a boxer, he's a pugilist, right? Trying to sign intellectual and all of that, <laughs> right? But if we get to the nuts and bolts of what Jack Johnson's job was, Jack Johnson's job was to put white men on their asses in an era in which black men were killed for even enacting what we call reckless eyeballing. That's the act of a black person looking a white person in the face. If a black person didn't cross the street when a white person was coming their way, it might have gotten them killed. In this era, Jack Johnson, his job was to put these white men on their asses. But you know, Jack couldn't be cool. Jack in some ways defined early of mid, you know, turn of the 20th century black swag. So you see Jack on the one hand as a pugilist, and then you see Jack with the fur coat and the Model T. And this is important because Jack driving around in his Model T where most white Americans were not driving Model Ts. So he's what we call the uppity Negro. He also had this other little habit that folks were bothered by, both black and white folks. He liked to put it nicely, he liked to love across the color line. Right? Jack loved himself some white women. <laughs> and of course, in 1904, 1906, 1909, that may create a problem, which explains why Jack Johnson was the first American ever indicted on the Mann Act. The Mann Act, which made it illegal to transport underage women, in parentheses white women, across state lines for purposes of prostitution. Jack Johnson was the first person in America indicted on the Mann Act. You might argue that the Mann Act was created for him. He represented a kind of threat because what Jack Johnson represented was progress. And very often progress will generate as a response white rage. So if you have this black man that represents a certain kind of progress, and let's be clear, he also made black people uncomfortable, you need an antidote. Of course, you might need a few antidotes. At the same time that Jack Johnson becomes the heavyweight boxing champion, the gentleman on the right, Burt Williams, becomes the most well-known black entertainer in the country. In fact, he's black America's first crossover success. He was not born in the United States, he was light-skinned, which is why when he appeared on stage, he appeared on stage as a black-faced minstrel. And then you look next to, to Mr. Williams, you have a gentleman whose birth name was Lincoln Perry, but if you are a historian of early 20th century American film, you know him as Step and Fetch It, as in Step and Go Fetch It. <laughs> So you had images that were construed to counter the representations of progress that someone like Jack Johnson represented. But of course, there are always responses in this context. So by the time we get to the 1940s and 1950s, and I picked these particular figures importantly because they were not necessarily political figures, but figures who came out of the entertainment industry. 
So we have Paul Robeson, right, who of course is not only an all-American football player graduating from Rutgers at the beginning of the 20th century, he's also a well-known orator. He's also an actor, right? He's also a communist, right? And so he becomes the embodiment of a generation of young black entertainers and actors and athletes who become politicized in the mid 20th century. One of the people that he most politicized is the gentleman who was simply known as a calypso singer in the 1950s, Harry Belafonte, right? And of course, Halle Berry Fonte, if we go forward to 2016, is mentoring a generation of black actors and actresses and entertainers about being politically committed. What that generation creates is a particular generation of athletes that emerge in the 1960s. The late Muhammad Ali, that's his famous photo on the cover, Esquire magazine, 1966. He was very good friends with Malcolm X, who happened to be a photographer and archivist himself. Muhammad Ali might have been the most photographed athlete of the 20th century. Right, and very consciously staged his own images. Right? This is a photo of Malcolm X taking a photo of Muhammad Ali. Behind, below them, you have a picture of Muhammad Ali and Sam Cooke, the great vocalist, because Sam Cooke, Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, and Jim Brown, who was in that fourth photo, were in fact close friends for an 18-month period until the death of Sam Cooke in December of 1964 and Malcolm X in February of 1965. They represented the coming together of a particular generation of athletes and entertainers that represented a certain notion of progress. But we know whenever progress emerges, there has to be an antidote. And the antidote was the transcendent Negro. The person that you might argue might be the only black man of the 20th century to ever transcend race. That would be Mr. Orenthal James Simpson. To fully understand who O.J. Simpson was as a football player at USC in the late 1960s, you have to look at someone like Jim Brown. Jim Brown, who was an all-American football player, who was an all-American lacrosse player. Famous story about Jim Brown showing up on the lacrosse field with his lacrosse stick and the white coach going, who gave that Negro a stick? but he also was politically engaged. So they needed an antidote. The antidote was Orenthal, who one time was asked, how do you feel about being a black athlete? And he goes, I'm not black, I'm OJ. And when I say that he's a Negro that transcended race, he was the dude that when you saw OJ, great football player, bad actor, Somebody who I might want to have a beer with, right? You would name six or seven things before you got to the point. It's like, oh yeah, and O.J. Simpson's a black dude. So much he transcended race that he was a spokesperson for a mainstream con uh, company like Hertz. If you got a chance to see O.J. Made in America, they talk about him doing the commercials with him, and they're saying to themselves, okay, we just can't have one singular Negro running through the airport. <laughs> that might create some concerns, right? So they would always have a white person in the commercial that could co-sign that he was somebody significant. Oh, hey, OJ. <laughs> he was that Negro. And again, to put this in some sort of context, when we talk about antidotes to progress, Muhammad Ali, who was infinitely a much more visible and popular athlete at the time that OJ Simpson was hawking for Hertz, Muhammad Ali was a pitch person for Roach Spray. Think about that for a second. And of course, all of that leads to 1994, how quickly <laughs> they slide down. And this is a particular photo for Time Magazine that is also mediated by the artist Hank Willis Thomas, the idea of the fall of the proper nigger. When by the time we get to the 1990s and 2000s, we see a certain kind of remixing of these images. So you could see someone like LeBron James on the cover of a mainstream magazine with a white fashion model, but somehow that photograph looks something straight out of 1930s <laughs> newspapers and magazines where the Nazis are depicted <laughs> as King Kong, <laughs> and King Kong is running away with American white women. And somehow, that is LeBron James 
70 years later. We look at the two photos on the right, the two photos at the bottom, Eldrick Tiger Woods, the golfer who kind of transcended race, and Sean Carter, the hustler, the drug dealer from Brooklyn. Which one of them is the rapper and which one of them is the golfer? <laughs> if you look at these photos. <laughs> Interesting kind of mix there, right? As the images of progress and non-progress get a little complicated. And while elite black men have the ability to wear whatever uniforms they wear, things look a little different for everyday black men. When Mike Brown was killed in August of 2014, there were immediately these photos of Mike Brown that depicted him in his less humane humanity, if you will. And of course, black Twitter got on and it began to address that to mainstream media. If you're going to depict him, how about depicting him in a way that highlights his humanity but doesn't just simply connect to the narrative that's being told to folks from law enforcement? So you had young black people cognizant of what was happening, right? With a mean said, if I got killed, how would the media choose to depict me? So they shot selfies of themselves in ways that they know the media would depict them versus how they are in everyday life, right? So much so that they forced the New York Times to actually write an article to respond to the type of visual biases that corporate news, in fact, engage in in the context of these situations. What you have is a musician and you have a student, you have someone who served in law enforcement, right? Recognizing that the time came, very rarely were they actually depicted in those kind of contexts. Of course, that brings us to this particular historical moment. Gentleman from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a family man. Another gentleman from Minneapolis another family man, right? This idea of black men as an endangered species. And when we think about a society that's afraid and fearful of these black men, where are these narratives coming from? And we realize that in many ways they are historicized. This last photo, the art of Hank Willis Thomas, a piece simply called Strange Fruit. What are the kinds of emotions that are generated when you see a photo like this, right? This is a contemporary photo. This is a piece of art that's been done in the last five years. The great poet and aestheticist, Amir Baraka, talked about the changing same. And what we see in terms of the presentation of black masculinity in American culture, despite young black men pulling up their paired pants and wearing bow ties, is a continued circulation of them as strange fruit. Thank you very much. <laughs>